Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, welcome. If this is the first time you're here, then, you know, we're happy to have you. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, let me give you a little bit of a tour uh, to make sure you understand what you're looking at here. You're probably in the attendees area if you're getting started. And then there's also a panelist area. The panelists showed up early. They had their, uh, they had good internet, good audio, and good video. And we kind of go through a process to check that in the morning. Uh, you can come here as early as 6 a.m., um, and if you, uh, if you come here at 6 a.m., uh, we're all just talking. Sometimes we'll work on somebody's camera or their green screen, or we'll just talk about, you know, life. And so it's a very loose conversation from 6 to 6.30. At 6.30, we hand out the Discord link. The Discord link, the Discord is about 400 of us that two or three hours isn't enough. So we keep on talking all day on text. So if you want to join that community, uh, you can uh, use the Discord link. You need to be here at 6.30. It expires at, uh, at 7 o'clock. So by the time you hear me do the announcement, it's gone. You have to come tomorrow. So, uh, but you can join Discord at 6.30. Then at 6.40, we start mic checks. Um, so everyone here just went through a mic check. Some of you probably watched us do that. Uh, that is starts at 6.40. Once we start mic checks, we typically don't let anybody else in. So that, that kind of is the end of that process. Um, so if you're interested in that, just come early and uh, try to make sure you have a good, uh, there's a little pressure. So try to make sure that you have good internet, good audio, good video before you, uh, before you join. Now, if you're, now that you're an attendee, one thing to, to note, notice is that you have a Q&A and you have a chat at the bottom. If you have a question, please ask it. We prioritize. We will ask all the questions in the Q&A before we go to the panelists. And usually the first hour is all just Q&A from the Q&A area. Ask the question early. If you, if you start asking, a lot of times we get questions at like 7.50, <laughs> get like six of them. We're not going to get to those. So, so anyway, so you want to make sure that you um, ask those questions early. If you have burning questions, come in here early and, and get those questions in. You can also vote on the questions. That is going to prioritize when we cover those. So if you see questions that you like and you want to make sure that we ask them, um, then make sure to, uh, to vote those questions up. You can put, uh, make sure that the questions, by the way, is one question per post. Uh, one question per post and don't allow it to be more than, we'll say five lines. We, we used to say four. We're going to stretch it to five lines. But it's got to stay in five lines. If they're longer than that or if they're a comment, or if they have multiple questions, we're just gonna dismiss them. So, um, so you just need to make sure that you keep it in there. It's just, it's just hard for us to keep everything moving uh, if, if there's a lot of long and complicated questions. Um, you can still chat all you want and you can ask questions in the chat. We're just not gonna answer them it's here. People in the chat will answer them, but we won't answer them on our own. Also, if you're new to being a panelist, please don't interact. Other than voting, please don't interact with the questions. Uh, it really makes it hard for us to do what we do. So, um, you know, so don't start answering questions or texting questions or in touching the questions other than the voting up and down um, to make that work. Uh, we've got a busy week uh, that, that we've already started here. Um, today, at, we have a second hour, if you're new to this today, we have second hours that are um, every, after the first hour is all Q&A, the second hour is, is usually some specific topic that we're interested in, in, in looking at. And so today we're going to have, um, we're going to talk about collaborative music uh, creation. So the idea of remote production, uh, really at a professional level. And so uh, Victor Cajeo, Fra Francis Shepard, and Jeff Francis will discuss how they've been working through that and testing those things uh, over the last uh, last couple of weeks. And they're going to give us kind of a, an in, it, well, and they've been doing it for a long time. So these are very, uh, very experienced professionals uh, working working on it. So they're going to talk a little bit about uh, how they're how they're approaching that right now. Tomorrow, Chris Summers is going to lead a discussion on camera LUTs. What are camera LUTs? Why, why do they matter and how we can use them? So Chris is going to be talking about that tomorrow. On Thursday, we've got Thomas Kelly, who was former, formerly part of the Obama administration, talking about what it's like to produce media for the White House. So he's going to be answering your questions and, and, and talking through those, those processes there. We have a bonus hour on Thursday with Oliver Breidenbach, who's going to be doing tips and tricks from Memo Live. Um, and so, uh, so you know, if you want to stay for yet another hour, you can stay with and, and hang out with, uh, with Oliver. And then finally, on Friday, we have uh, Steve Brazil, uh, who has done a ton and of, of great concert photography, and he's going to be talking about what it takes to do that, and how, how he got into it, and, and what, he's, what he's doing there. I think it's going to be a fantastic hour talking about photography there. And then Saturday, of course, is our long, uh, our long day. We, um, we have Q&A for two hours instead of one. And then at 9 o'clock, Nick Justishan's talking about Unreal Engine. At 10 o'clock, Steve Bays, former uh, a pro senior product manager for Final Cut, is talking about Final Cut, deep cuts, and how to take the most advantage of it. And then um, at 11, uh, I'll be talking about building graphics for live events. And then at noon, we're talking about networking with Aaron Mailer. So that's, our, that's kind of our week 
coming up uh, that, that that you can look forward to. And uh, without further ado, we're going to jump into the uh, into the questions. Chris, what do we got? Good morning, Alex. Uh, Hasmuk was interested. He he was shopping for the Black Magic Pocket 4K. Surprised it came with a lens. Seems like he has a choice between the Olympus and the Panasonic Lumix. And for Zoom meetings, which lens should he look at? Um, I don't know which lens in those. There's the, the there's a lot of lenses that in that in each one of those groups. Um, one thing to look at is whether you want to have control over your zoom. So the Panasonic, um, I don't think the Olympus ones will do this, but the Panasonic, some of the Panasonic, I think it's the OIS or IOS. It's OIS, I think. They're they're kind of uh, motorized lenses, and that's what I have on one of my overhead lenses, the Lumix, and it is. Uh, you can then control your zoom th through the switcher as well as your um, focus. So most of the lenses that you're going to get with a uh, pocket cinema or any of the micro four thirds will be able to, you'll be able to just focus, which is very, very useful. Um, you know, in my opinion, it's almost worth having a mini just so that you can do that. The, but the, the main thing is, is that once you get the, the Panasonic motorized lenses or powered lenses, you're now going to be able to focus in and focus out. Now, I don't really need that that much for what I'm doing. Um, but what I what what's useful for me there is that I um, uh, is if I have it as an overhead camera that I'm trying to look at and I want to be able to control it from my switcher, it's a lot easier than reaching up and focusing, doing the, those the, the, that type of thing. Um, and uh, let's see here, I am oh Roscoe, sorry Roscoe, you're new and your name doesn't show up on my on my uh, on, on my teleprompter, so I was like I don't I don't know who that is. <laughs> anyway, so what what, what what do you have to add? That's fine. I would I would look at the uh, it's the Lumix, but I'd look at the uh, 1.7, uh, the 25 millimeter, which is a 50 millimeter and a full frame. Um, really a nice little lens. Uh, it's human vision perspective, uh, focusable, all that kind of stuff. But and I would avoid anything anything that changes the f-stop as you zoom in or out because those just drive you crazy. And if you're they're, using they're it, depends on. I agree with you. I think that if it's um, if you're using it for what we're doing here. Then I would I would tend to recommend some kind of zoom lens, um, and the only reason is is you end up moving the camera a lot to get just the right frame, and so having I think a lot of the ones that I have on the one I have on here right now is a uh, twelve to, I think it's a twelve to forty two, and um, it's not particularly uh, you know high quality lens it's a re relatively good lens. Um, but it's not incredible. But the main thing is, is that having that little zoom from 12 to 42 at about the range that you're sitting there. So if you're using a general purpose, I think that Roscoe, I completely agree with you. If you're using it specifically for what we're doing here, I'd probably look for something in, in, in for, for the micro four thirds. I'd probably look at it somewhere between 12 and 42 or 15 and 45, somewhere in that range of a zoom lens, because it just happens to be the one that makes it, I'm right in about the middle of that. Um, right now, so close to the 25. But when you have a fixed lens on a person as a single stand uh, sit sitting or a stand up, the problem is you end up having to move the camera to get your 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 uh, frame. Whereas oftentimes you want to be able to focus it, you want to be able to move that you know that your frame without having to move the camera. Um, so that that would be my only uh, recommendation there. Any other? Uh, go ahead, Victor. Uh, yeah, I and really. Jan, and then we'll be done. Go ahead. The Lumix 12 to 35 with a fixed 2.8 aperture. Expensive lens, eight hundred dollars. Right. Uh, it's what I'm using now, but it really does a job at any focal length. So I love that. Great, Jan. And then we're going to move on to the next one. Uh, on the cheap side, if you don't want to buy a new camera, there's a, if you and if you're using a Mac, there is an app called Eyeglasses, and you could do a lot. Move, you can move, zoom in and out. You can move your frame up right. and down, and uh, I've been using it for years, and I'm using a C920. And uh, I think I look pretty good, at least to myself. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Next question, Chris. Uh, Paul Wallace from ATX uh, in the morning to you. What is the best lightweight, long range RF microphone, which has good quality audio and good persistence? Anybody have, a, have their favorite? Looks like Paul just wants a great RF mic. I mean, I usually call Sennheiser on something RF like that. You know, we, you know, the, the, um, you know, I'll, we'll lean towards, I mean, long distance <laughs> scares me in general of RF, you know, so, so I, you know, when you say, it, I don't know what long distance necessarily means is that for you 50 feet or hundred feet or 300 feet, um, you know, there are, you, you can in general, in general terms, uh, you know, we're using 
for the higher end stuff that we do, we're using Axiant. Uh, in a film environment, we're oftentimes using Electros, um, you know, for you know for those uh, transmissions, um, and then multiple. Oftentimes, we have multiple receivers, you know, for you know for those types of things, which you're mixing to cover a larger area. And then you can, of course, move to point to point. Tucker. Yeah, the Sure ULXD is kind of a, the starting point that we go with. It's uh, Sure's digital wireless, yep. and then or above. And if you're looking for something that uh, that you can get for relatively inexpensively these days, uh, the older UHF R stuff, uh, which is fully analog, um, has very very good persistence. But the antenna selection is a really important piece of it. Um, if you're trying for long distance, you'll need to you know go through a process of finding those uh, professional wireless systems has a lot of really good white papers on that um, and a lot of good options. So. And, and, and I still, most of us will lean towards Axiant for the highest quality, longest the, distance, you know, like once you, once you get past the sure Axiant, we're now bringing in specialists um, and they are considerably, the, the Axiant is considerably more stable than the Sennheiser 2000s. I can tell you that from personal experience. <laughs> so Bill and then, and then Leland and then we'll bump out. Yeah, just remember that a lot of these manufacturers, <clears throat> excuse me, Sennheiser in particular has a lot of lines, so you can get everything from the G series to the AVXs to the, and then they go up into the stratosphere. So sometimes a manufacturer, just be wary of the fact that you will see that one pair is fifteen hundred dollars, another pair is four thousand dollars, and you can get something at five or six hundred dollars. Those are different lines, and they have yep. specifically the different uh, reliabilities for distance. Leland. Yeah, an important point we have to mention is that any of these older RF mics that are in the 600 megahertz band will not be available for use after July 13th of this year. That is all being taken by the FCC, so you're not going to be able to use those microphones on air any longer. So you're going to have to watch buying older equipment that's using that six. It's actually the 617 to 652 and 663 to 698 megahertz. And that's an incredibly that important point because uh, you're probably going to see a lot of that stuff on eBay and every place yes, else thinking you're absolutely. getting a really good yep. system cheap. And, and Mickey, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, for for wireless, um, signal strength is basically uh, a how how the the receiver sees the signal to noise ratio. So when when you're dealing with I don't I same I don't know what long range means, but um, getting your antennas closer, like having multiple antennas, would would be better than getting a higher powered transmitter. And also filtering. Think about filtering in your antenna <clears throat> in your antenna chain. So and then you're also you start essentially, from, and yeah, you start. essentially get your signal to to noise ratio better. Right, and you're essentially starting to move away from just the general antennas to fins and you know a lot of things to kind of extend that. Yeah, extend definitely. That and fins fins would would uh, uh, work better in longer range situations compared to omnidirectional antennas. Just again, signal to noise ratio. Okay, Tucker, last one. This is a good question, so we're, we're spending a little more time on it, but Tucker, last one, and then we'll move on. Um, with the, if you're only, if you're talking about a single channel, um, the microphones that, that overlap that sold area uh, of the spectrum, they actually extend down below. Most of them, especially like the Shures and Sennheisers, extend into the range that's still legal to use. So if you're only needing one or two or three channels, um, you can still pick up a, uh, a unit that will be in, that, that operates in the illegal band, but also operates a little bit in the, the normal band. So you could definitely pick up for a single or, or two channel use uh, a pretty inexpensive mic like that. And, the, and, and I will say that the, the legality of it is mostly also where you're at. If you're anywhere near an event or you're anywhere in a city, you're going to get hit pretty quickly. If you're if you have these these things laying around and you're going to go into the country or you're using them at your house and you're in a general rural area, no one's going to notice. <laughs> so so don't worry Although, about it too much. Rural is one of the places where you're going to see it get stepped on more because a lot of wisps are purchasing that bandwidth. Right. Right. Yeah. So it, I mean, eventually, but I'm just saying that it, it's as it starts as it starts the hands over. You still probably if you have a bunch of these. I have some friends that have a bunch of electros, and we're going to keep them around just in case we need extra mics for distant areas until they start getting stepped on. You know, so um, anyway, uh, next, uh, next. I'm always amazed at the breadth and depth of knowledge in this group. Yeah. Um, Tom <laughs> Wadarska says, uh, where are we on the adoption curve of HEVC and H265? What's your opinion? Uh, 
my opinion is is that 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 um, H two sixty five is coming. Uh, it's necessary for some of the next generation stuff that we're doing. So all the H two sixty five is really necessary to get the HDR and you know a bunch of other things delivered. So I think that we're going to see more of it rolling out. The big holdup has been largely because of the licensing of the fees that they want to that they want to charge and and so MPEG has kind of screwed this up every time. <laughs> so so they did they did it okay where they didn't talk about it at all for H264 and then they decide okay now we want to get our claws into it. And so what that did is it created a lot of there's a lot of demand and when it's slowing it down is the big players, the Facebooks, the YouTubes who are going to have to pay for this have been really working pretty hard at finding less expensive solutions. You know, and um, and so they uh, so they, a lot of them have been trying to work around it. You'll see AV1 um, is, is one of the pieces there, VP9. Those are all things that they're like, hey, we don't want to pay for this. Um, and so, uh, so it's, it's already pretty popular as a backhaul. The, the, uh, um, the elemental links that we're talking about are using H.265. And so, so they're already, and you're getting a lot more efficiency. Um, so, so as a mezzanine connection, it's already taking, it's, getting some some edge to it um, and it'll still roll out it, the risk is always that and and the the patents are so good that they'll probably roll out but it's it's been one of those things that's been very slow because of uh, licensing go ahead sky and then uh, Vipul. just briefly the difference between the FCC as a le legal body and the MPEG as a civilian uh, organization uh, just your thoughts and sure. opinions FCC is a government reg reg regulator. Uh, so they're telling you what you can and can't do with frequencies. MPEG is a consortium of private companies that pool their patents together to create a solution. So when you hear MPEG or you hear, um, you know, H.264 is an MPEG um, solution, H.265 is another MPEG solution. Um, so all those things are, it's the reason it's that way, it's the motion, um, I'm not going to try to, I can not, it's too early in the morning for me to try to write Motion out, Picture it, Experts Group. Yeah, there we go. So, but they're, they basically pooled their patents and then they all get money back from that. And, um, and so it's not a regulatory organization, it's a patent pool you know, and research group you know, that, that, that does that. But they're trying to get their money back, their investment back. The hard part that they have now is that there's a lot of companies that are giving away something for free and what they're, you know, not free, but for advertising. And so the numbers that they're talking about turn into really big numbers to those companies like YouTube and Facebook and Netflix and so on and so forth. And so that's causing um, they, I don't think they they manage that very well, and it's hard because it's there's a whole bunch of people you have to get to agree on something, and so um, as a result, it's moved very slowly. While all these companies are trying to find any way but that to distribute their content, and you know, and and so um, that's been what's slowing it down. H two sixty five has been, of course, around for years now, maybe a decade or at least five years. Now, where we've been using it as mezzanine because it's about fifty percent more efficient than than h264 um, but the and it, again we're going to have to use it for some stuff coming up uh, but it's been one of those things that everybody's kind of slow you know they're 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 trying to find a better solution because it's it's so expensive for for the really large players Vipul? 265 has been very popular in actually cctv cameras ip cameras most of the last two years three years cameras they come with 265. They are very yep. efficient in compression and good quality. So yep. 265 and the is already there. It's, it's there for, for security cameras because you're not doing large distribution because then you'd have to pay for it. You know, so it's cheap to put it in a camera at, you know, in, in encoding. So that's why the, the, the CCU, it's, it's not showing up in big distribution uh, like YouTube and Facebook and so on and so forth because they'd have to pay really big check. They'd have to write very large checks. So that's why you're seeing it in places where, and that's why we can use it as a, backhaul you know so we can use it as our mezzanine connection because we aren't having well you know we're not having to pay for it um beju uh just a uh, question about you mentioned that the elementary is i just want to say beju, you sound so much better it. i just have to say you sound so much better with the new mic i just i was like oh all those all those yeah. all those sessions with it all ringing out it sounds great anyway okay we'll go back to it you finally arrived the question i had you mentioned that the element is using h265 uh as the codec to transcode to uh, transmit to the cloud uh, does it use HS, HLS as well, or it's just using H.265? Uh, Zixi. So it's, it, Zixi. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly uh, which, how it's packaging it, but we're going to, I'm going to be doing more about that. But it's basically using a Zixi wrapper um, with an H.265, and it may, I think it's RTP, but I'm not 100% sure uh, against that. But it's Zixi is the, is the wrapper for it, uh, of how it's, how it, the, the protocol that it's using um, to get to, uh, to get there. So. 
yeah and it's, it's super stable you know so far uh anyway next yeah. uh next question out of curiosity alex your mic is doing that thing where the audio level is slowly going up and down again i remember we discussed it if there's something you can eat it's not horrible but Mickey and I were just chatting about it. Uh, Michael Tucker says, I am interested in learning about what is presented at the live you presser, which is currently on. Could someone please monitor uh, the new items? Uh, Kevin McArdle says that it's an L800 unit, which is a multi yeah. unit. So your okay. audio is way down now. My audio is way um, down now? Yeah. Oh, interesting. I was trying to fix it. Hold on. Is it better? I should have done the mic check. See, this is what I get for skipping the mic check. I changed a couple things, so it is going to be a okay. Thing. Yeah. Is it is it any better now? Uh, I know that Tucker had to step out. Maybe uh, it's a little bit. I, I have lots of headroom. Up. I just I just need to know where I need to. Yeah, yeah it should probably come up a little, but I'm guessing it goes I mean, up and down meters. inconsistently. Okay. I don't know what I don't know what part of that that part hasn't changed. I'm not sure exactly what. It just started in the past three minutes. Oh. And I'm going to guess you don't have an automatic gain control switch on your units. No, no, I do not. Um, I don't know what would cause that. Anyway, we're going to have to keep going. Um, Kevin, Kevin Murphy says, uh, what's the recommended solution for a push to talk with Zoom? I do use the space bar currently, but I don't like it. And according to Alex, it is the double. Uh the, the the right one is to click on the mute and unmute on the on the interface. <laughs> like like I just I'm sorry, but nothing else I see. I mean, I watch all of you guys do this, and I I have no other than having a manual version of it where you're you're muting your mic with your own button and in an analog way. Everybody has problems with it when they when they spent Stream Deck, all these other ones, these automatic like little click ons, um, is one of those things that it just isn't working. Yeah, Chris. You know, it was interesting the other day I was doing a screen scrape of a Zoom interview and I muted my mic and I believe I coughed while I because I wasn't part of the interview and the little prompt came up that said, yeah. oh, you might be trying to talk. And I was like, oh, and I ruined the recording. You ruined the. So when I mute, if you mute using the Zoom mute and you talk into your microphone, it you. remind you, oh, by the way, you're. You might be muted, and it and it does it with a big obnoxious uh, 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 pop up. Of course, on the it screen. does that to make sure that you're not sitting there talking. Of course, it's trying to help, and it kills my recording. Yeah, there you go, Chris, and then Jan, and then we'll move on. Thanks. Just from the fear, sheer terror of trying to be on quickly in this group, uh, Shift Command A on the Mac has worked very, very well for me as like a muscle memory key, because it's just in my left hand. And it works in all the windows. The problem with spacebar is it's push to talk. Like you have to keep holding it down. And if you're in the chat, it won't work. But Shift Command A will work app wide. And that for me on a very basic setup has worked. Alt A on the PC. Yeah, same thing. All right, Alt Jan. Jan? Yeah, what I find is that if you open the participants window, you're in full view and you open the participant window, on the right side, it'll say invite, mute me, and raise hand. And that is always fixed in the same position. So it's really easy to get to it. You just got to be a little part, um, uh, um, getting ready to do it so that your, your mouse is over the button. Push to um, talk. Push to talk does make sense now. Yeah, you hold it down. That makes sense. It's working for me. Yeah, but I've also found that if you don't have the right window targeted, push to talk sometimes doesn't work. So if my mouse pointer is off on Q&A or something, it's push to talk doesn't work. That's yeah, why I, I like the participant button I'll, so much because it's always well, there and it works all the time. I, I now have I'll to admit that I, I literally, no. I literally if, if I'm if I'm muting, I literally roll my mouse over and I click on the mute button. <laughs> I just like, I'm just like, it just, I just know you're, that it works and it doesn't work. You're also the leader it, of the meeting and are talking 90% of the time. It's a little I know, but, but I turn it off, you. but there's a lot of times I turn it off. If you watch my little thing, well, if the other people are talking, I'm sitting there typing or I'm doing something else and I'm turning it on and off mm. all, all through the meeting. Um, okay. Anyway, so uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, Craig Lomas says, uh, the modern connector designs are getting increasingly flimsy. Does anybody have any handy hints or hardware for providing a secure connection and strain relief for USB-C HDMI cables to and from show PowerPoint graphic laptops. Something better than USB-C. Yeah, uh, oh, has a gizmo that you plug into 
to make the connection a little bit more secure. It's like $7. I'll try to make a link to it. Tape. Yeah. I mean, Chris, Chris was showing tape. I mean, we, the, what, what I will say from a bending perspective, it doesn't help, but we tape all our connections during events. So when we, you know, we run, we run tape across, across all, you know, once we plug them all in, we tape them all to keep them from jiggling, you know, jiggling out. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I do the same thing. And basically, I almost always, if I have a board or anything else with a lot of lines running into it, set up a spare mic sand, lock it down, sandbag it, and literally gaffers tape strain relief onto all the cables coming into it that way. Yeah, strain relief is a super important, you know, piece of the puzzle is to is to really make sure that you're, um, you don't have, and this is everywhere, is like, don't have things that are going out of your switcher or your audio or whatever and just running out you want to find some place for them to go that 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 you have it taped or 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 somehow grabbed a lot of our kits have um pass-throughs so from the inside of the kit to the outside of the kit there's a a bar and if someone grabs onto something maybe it rips out that one connection but it doesn't rip it out of the actual electronics and so strain reliefs are, are super important i know that chris has talked about it in the past with filmmaking you know, with film film production studios where you're you're finding ways to tie down those cables all the time. So if someone trips or yanks on it, they're not yanking on the electronics. And then just make sure that you have enough of a tail coming off of it when you do that so that it, it's kind of comes out and goes in. So there's a little bit of a safety there. But anytime you see a cable that's that's bending right after it came out of your device, you're putting strain in the and the larger that connector is, the more leverage it has. And so the more strain you're putting on that connection and, and over time, that's going to damage that connection. Um, uh, go ahead, Roscoe. Uh, Velcro on the bottom of the uh, laptop is a uh, big helpful. Just use those, uh, the cable wrap, Velcro strap, use those around the cables and then Velcro it to a permanent patch that's kept on the bottom of the laptop. That doesn't cool. leave a lot of tape do behind. And just uh, to elaborate on what you said, Alex, rather than get the adapters that are only an inch long, get the corded ones that have an interface on each end. That way, that relieves the tension right away on the back of a machine. It just drops off the back rather than sticking straight up. Yep, absolutely. Um, and try to just know that every time you put an adapter in, in, in of any sort, you're, you're putting in a, a single point of failure. <laughs> so a, a very a flimsy point of failure. So as much as you can, having straight cables is, is something you want to kind of lean towards. Jeffrey? There is a, for USB-C, there is a plug adapter with a thumb screw option. I've seen it, uh, my Sonnet has one, and there is, a, there is a way to put it onto like a laptop, uh, but I, have, I, have, I haven't looked at those in a while. I just use tape myself, but that is another option. It seems like you could, uh, I haven't seen this, I'm just making this up right now, but it seems like you could build a, a snap-on case, you know, kind of like what, I, like I have a, uh, my laptop, um, my older laptop here, this has, this is all uh, Lego <laughs> that's on the top of this. And the reason that this is good is, is, is I have these little flat pieces. And what I do with them is I, um, I super glue them to modems and drives and everything else. So then when I'm on set, I can just snap them onto the back of my um, computer. Uh, and so then it'll, if I pick up my computer, the drives and everything else come that's with brilliant, it. That's brilliant, dude. Um, it, works, it works really well. And uh, so, so it, it looks pretty funny in production because you'll have like two, a, a drive and a modem and, and oftentimes like my mini recorder or something else all stuck to the, to the, um, to the computer. Link, please. Uh, it's on Amazon. I think if you just do Lego top, I don't know if they, you know, this is an older one that I haven't up, updated to, but yeah, if someone can find it, it's, it was just on Amazon. I just ordered it and um, I've had it for years and I use it in production all the time. And anyway, but I think that, you know, when you think about those things to snap, you know, it'd be great to have something that, you know, snapped onto the bottom here, but then had um, some kind of coming out of here, like it actually literally popped out that had some way to lock it, you know, and you can have tie downs and, you know, everything else where it's really built. It's not built for you to put it in your backpack. It's built for when I sit down at a location, how do I, how do I tie everything down or, or, or fix everything that goes in to protect the computer? Um, a brick book, a brick book is, I guess, what it call, is, is what it's called. There's Paul's showing it there. So the brick book is the uh, thing and it is, it fits perfectly with Legos. So my, I would keep on buying my son Legos and just go, you can have all the Legos. I just need all the flat pieces. <laughs> so your job is to go through the Legos. I didn't want to go through the Legos. You go through the Legos and as long as you keep on giving me flat pieces, I'll give you more Legos. <laughs> and so he has a very large collection of Legos now. All right. Anyway, next question. Out of curiosity with the tie down, do you tape down your MagSafe connector, Alex? 
Just, uh, yeah. just curious. <laughs> I do, absolutely. <laughs> so Philip Oller says, uh, it appears that Wirecast cannot record ISOs of the rendezvous calls. Are there any workarounds for this besides not using Wirecast? I think that's the answer. Ronnie Boo is not a very stable environment. You've, you've <laughs> I mean, answered I think, your own question. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that our our our, uh, uh, our general opinion is not has not been super high of Rendezvous in in general. It's been a it's been a difficult. I, I think it hasn't really worked for them very well. And every I don't know. I mean, people here have talked about it a little bit. I know that that I've run into it where it's you're just. Uh, every time I'm on a rendezvous call for some, and I haven't had to use it for production, but every time I'm on a call, there's something going wrong. Like it's every single time, you know, it's a hundred percent of the time. So it has me not, not feel comfortable about the, uh, about the situation. Um, there is one close answer. If you wanted to try to use Skype, perhaps inside Wirecast and bring a caller in maybe through NDI or something like that, there are options opportunities to avoid yep. their rendezvous system that's a good point and that's try it point. another way but yeah so you uh, could you could do skype and then use the ndi and skype to pass it to because wirecast will see the ndi output yeah. so you could theoretically do that but then you would need something on skype it would be you're gonna, you're start gonna have to play with the audio mixing yeah you'll have to virtually mix the audio with a cable or something like that to get it in the way i'd be tempted to put like skype on a cool. separate machine yeah, you know, then, do, then try to do, do all that. of this on one machine. Skype is already a pretty big hog, and Wirecast is a hog. There's a whole bunch of, of, of uh, processor hogs in that pipeline, and you'd probably end up with some unhappy experiences uh, if you're not careful. Uh, anyway, next, next, next one. Salvador Garza says um, he, he wants to know if anybody has any good or bad experiences to share about the Zcam E2 cameras. Um, we haven't, I don't, I haven't used them. Uh, I see them at, uh, at, at, shows all the time, but I haven't, I haven't actually put one into place. We, we've seen them in a couple shoots where we're putting, um, uh, we are, I'm just to make sure I'm talking about the right one. Yeah. So we've seen them in a, in a couple places where we're, um, where we're shooting with, uh, 180 degree lenses on them. Um, and, and so that's and a four by three CMOS is useful in that in that sense. Um, I think that it doesn't have SDI. <laughs> like, like that's, so, so that, you know, like it, I feel like Zcam doesn't really get I, I get that eventually we're going to go to Ethernet and everything else. But when a camera shows up that's, that's supposed to be high quality and doesn't have an SDI output, I immediately decide that they don't really understand production because, you know, an HDMI and Ethernet output is not usable for me. So I think that every time I look at the Zcam stuff, I go, oh, this would be really cool. And then I go, oh, it doesn't have SDI. And listen, does it, did they add it? I don't think they did. I think that they, um, but every time I've seen it, it's just like, oh, it doesn't have the th one thing that I, you know, that I needed. So, um, so I, you know, without, without SDI, I have a hard time um, implementing it in my pipeline. So that's why I don't, use, that's why I don't have one. So, or haven't used them. Uh, anyway, let's, next, next question. Uh, Jeff Hahn says for live production, not wired through switcher, does anyone know of a way to hotkey reliable synced time code to a spreadsheet using a Mac without drift? Interesting. I can tell you something that I used to do, and it's not exactly what you're doing, but close. Um, text expander on a Mac has a way where you can create a shortcut where you can type in hours, minutes, and seconds of the day, which is if, if you set your, if, you, if everything is set to time of day, you're within maybe a second of actual time code. And you can just hit that shortcut into a spreadsheet there's and a, it'll th type it in for you. There's definitely some, um, I have to go back and look because it's been so long since I've had to do it, but there's definitely some script supervisor tools that will let you, um, there's definitely some script supervising tools that will, that will let you, um, that while you type, you just type the notes and it just grabs the time code. So you're, you got LTC coming into the computer and, <clears throat> and you're, so you're getting that time code from somewhere and, and you're, and, and, and you're, as you type, it just puts that note in. Uh, Mickey? Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, Movie Slate could do that. 
and it could grab time code from time code systems devices and I believe also Deneke devices. So yeah, that that's that um movie slate could do all the notes that are time code labeled. Time code stamped. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. And then and then you shine. Also on the Mac side, uh, the Lumberjack system, you know, Philip Hodgetts, it use, also uses time of day in a way that's super clever. And I've done it on some very high profile, fast turnaround jobs that I, I couldn't have done the job without it. Definitely time of day is easier. I mean, if you can sync it up, if your time yeah. of day is really sunk to the real time of day, it does make that easier. Um, if you don't have to sync to an external time, time clock, um, you can do time of day, and, and there's lots. I think there's lots of tools that will do that. Uh, uh, you know that will make that work. But Lumberjack is great. Go ahead, Yashai. Yeah, I just want to elaborate a, again because lumber Lumberjack it's it's a little more it's a little deeper than that. What it can do, you can prepare a bunch of a, a key code before. So let's say you're doing interview, and that's a good cut. So you're putting, you can put name, you can put a lot of metadata ahead of time, and just trigger them. And if you trigger with your finger in like 10 seconds later, you can move the cursor back in a way, tell it, okay, I want this thing, but 15 seconds ago, and then all that come into spreadsheet, Final Cut Pro X, and go right into the timeline for multicam. Right. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, Jeffrey and Jeffrey Orthwine and I did a fast turnaround at NAB a couple of years ago, um, and there were Apple people in the room watching it, leaning over to people that we knew saying, did, did they just shoot that like 30 minutes ago in the other room? And it was already on the screen and it was cut to music and but and it was all Lumberjack. Could not have done that job without Lumberjack. That's great. This is the first hour that we've ever gotten to where we where we no longer where, where we've gotten to the end of the question. So do, yeah. does anyone have anything any anything else they want to? We've, we finished bring? the internet. MJ. Yeah. Hey, I've got a question. So streaming to YouTube. Sorry, am I is my level okay here? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Um, does it matter if you send a higher quality mezzanine stream to them than what they recommend, or do they just throw away the extra bits? Like what happens there? Um, we tend we tend to send we tend to go pretty heavy on 4K if we're, if we're streaming to YouTube in 4K then we tend to go a, a, at a pretty heavy um, uh, encode um, because it does seem to improve there. Uh, otherwise, you don't want to be stingy about it, but you also don't have to go crazy. So you know, typically a mezzanine of of 1080, uh, you don't have to go over eight or 10 megabits per second. It's not going to make any difference after that. Um, it, you know, so, but you don't want to send it, you know, just sending it six necessarily. I mean, might, you might want to give it a little bit of headroom. We, a lot of times six is kind of our standard, you know, standard minimum for 1080p. And then we tend to target four for 720p, which means that there's actually more bits per pixel for the 720p than the 1080p. Um, but uh, six is a, is a pretty good number there. And then if we have it there, a lot of times we'll, we might go to eight or 10, but, but six is, is, is a pretty safe amount. You're not going to get that much more out of a 1080p signal 30. Now, if you're going to 60, then you want to go, you know, you technically want to go to 12, you know, but at least 10. Um, but, but if you're going to go to 60, you want to, you want to bump that up to uh, make up for the fact that you're sending twice as much data to, um, to the ingest. Uh, and the only place that I would use 60 at this point right now is, um, for sports and e-game, you know, e-sports and sports and something with a lot of fast moving dancing, a lot of fast moving um, issues. But in general, for streaming, uh, 30 is a pretty, pretty good number. The thing to know is that some people do send 24, <laughs> 2398 uh, into YouTube and Facebook. Just know that it's 30. If, it, if, if you're overseas and you do 25, uh, if you're a filmmaker and you do 24, it's going to go out as 30. And so what you're, when you don't, handle that ahead of time, you're just asking a generalized server that doesn't know you and doesn't care about you to upgrade, you know, to add more frames to your, to your show. Um, if you, if you think that you're going to go to a theatrical release or, or whatever, then do it in 24 and, and make that work. If you're only producing for an online platform, you really should consider 30 because then you're producing in the, in the, you're producing in the frame rate that the medium is using, and it's going to look the smoothest for the for the viewer. Um, you know, and, and I know that hurts a lot of people when you say that, but it's just they're not they're not asking, they're not thinking about it. It's thirty, and they're not they're not going to change that. You know, they're and they're not, it's not even twenty nine and seven. It's like thirty. Um, anyway, go ahead, Jeff, and then Bill, and then Chris. Oh, you're Jeff. You're muted. 
you're still muted. Sorry, was going to ask twenty nine nine seven or true thirty. You answered that. Yeah, you can send twenty nine nine seven. It'll it'll correct it. I mean, so you can definitely send twenty nine seven, but it doesn't care. It's going to be thirty when it when it what what the viewer is going to get is thirty frames a second. Um, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I've been surprised. I do a good little bit of delivery of video content to broadcast, and for decades, that's all they wanted was twenty nine nine seven standard. Just recently, in the past two or three years, even the bigger stations like our local NBC O and O, owned and operated station here in San Diego, has asked me for 24 frames. So some of those lines are blurring, and I, I don't know if you guys have ever delivered into broadcast, but it used to be that you would get a thick sheaf of paperwork with each station having its own broadcast standards, and it was a pain in the butt to deliver because you had to do. 10, maybe 15 different encodes for a 15 station buy. Nowadays, I'm surprised uh, the last time because of this crisis and shutdown and things like that, I asked um, the stations, can you just take a download off of my Vimeo Pro thing and see if you can work with it? And like 90% of them said yes, which was a huge boon to me and not having to do extra what I consider to be unnecessary work. So it's making a big difference for me. Well, what I will say is I'm pretty specific about how I deliver my stuff. And what I want to do is I want to I want control of it. As soon as I hand it off and say, can you just take something off my page? Or can you take something off of YouTube? Or if you can take something off, it is easier for me, but it means that they're going to mash it up, you know, a little bit. And so if I'm the creator, I want to give it to them in a way that is the the highest quality that to to deliver that that process. Um, and so, so my, my whole thing is, and, and it's pretty much anything I put out, like I want it to be as high as that medium, um, will, you know, if it, not the, I mean, this is the, the medium here is dis discussion. So how it goes out to YouTube is how it goes out to YouTube. But when we think about when I'm producing something, my daughter had a, um, I think we talked about this the other day. My daughter had a thank you to her school for her graduation video, you know, and I shot that in log you know, with, with a, you know, so, and, and did color correction, added vignette. I had a, you know, we, we did, we did some sound cancellation. Like, like it, my, my son was the, was the, um, was the boom operator. So, so the, you know, so there was, there was like a, a process there, you know, and, and, uh, and they had a great time doing it. But the point is, is that if you're a creator, you know, if you're just handing something off, that's going to be the news. I mean, we have to remember that news is kind of disposable anyway. So it's, it is, you know, um, it, it, it probably doesn't matter. But if you're, if you really care about whatever piece of content that you're creating, just always keep in mind that it's easy to create. It's, it's either easy to create or it's easy to watch, not usually both the same. And so as we, as we move towards easier to create or distribute, we move away from easier to watch and be interesting. I absolutely so, support that idea. So. That, and Alex is totally right. You should push for the most quality. This is your representation of your work to the world. I will say in these cases, I was shocked because I watched back on the local broadcasts and they were all, all my deliveries were indistinguishable from one another. And that just shocked me because it's not the world I came out of. The world I came out of was everything goes on scopes. Everything has to be well, absolutely it's, perfect. It's, and I'll argue that it's probably that their qualities, the quality standard of everything else they're delivering went down. <laughs> you know, like, so, you know, when they're, when they're letting everybody send all the stuff in and, and they, they just want the content that what's happening is, is the quality. And, and the, the real issue there is, is that as that, as broadcast allows the quality to come apart, they, what they don't realize is they're now dropping into the noise floor with everybody else, all the YouTubers and everything else who are actually, oftentimes the YouTubers are producing higher quality content than broadcast now, you know? And so broadcast is going, oh, we, we don't have the money we used to have. We just want to, and we have to move really fast. And we're, they're trying to keep up with online news and everything else that they're allowing themselves to get into that group where they, to be honest, they can't compete, you know? And so they're, they're you know, it's, it's it, we're seeing the end of broadcast. I mean, like we're not, when I say that, it's not going to be next year, but we're seeing over the next decade, it's just going to slowly wind out. And it'll be, it's not going to go away. Radio has been around for 100 years, and it'll be around for probably another 100 years. But um, it's not going to be what we grew up with. You know, it's, it's, it's on its way, you know, into a less relevant um, position. Chris Summers, and then Sky. Just for my own understanding and clarification, when uploading or sending content to YouTube coming out at 30, that's for live streaming only, I guess. Because we did tests a few weeks ago with Andrew McHardy, I think we were uploading and live streaming and just checking through Stats for Nerds, what we were getting. 
and it would stream at 30 for sure absolutely as you said but later if you were to view the content two or three days later it was still up on youtube it would default back to what it was shot at where the, i've never seen a live stream de default back but i haven't looked at it that much no, no the live stream was 30 the live stream was definitely 30 but the what was left on youtube later for viewing that was not live that was reverting oh, back to the original that material that, and i was just thinking is that a consideration because in Europe we're working off 50 hertz electricity and then you know working with 30 there's things to consider with strobing would, or other things we'd have to test it I'd have to test it against Facebook and, and YouTube and everything else that's an interesting test that I haven't done we looked at it just as 30 and we talked to the engineers about it and they were like it's 30 so the fact that it, it's going it's reverting back in the trans the, the the full transcode back to 24 is super interesting that and that might be new you know, it might be something that they that they added to it that I that since the last time we kind of ran tests, Sky and then Leland. Okay, I'm going to try the push to talk. Chris Summers, can you hear me? Okay, then I guess it works. So my history being in uh, originally in the LA market in TV, we had gatekeepers that were the engineers and that they would put things through scopes. But once we started going to the IT, I guess coming to the Seattle market, the homogenization of the the networks themselves they had star quality uh individual tv stations up here that were then bought up by the larger and larger and the quality continued to go down and the tv engineers were some of the first people to go and the it people they didn't have that quality so that's why i think right. this group is you're you're holding us to a higher standard but also in context and also in relationship to the competition now that everybody that the tool is no longer the barrier to entry right and, and the goal is is for us to constantly be having these kind of higher end conversations that we really understand it there's so many people that work in these industries that they kind of just know what people told them to do and they and and i'm learning stuff like chris has just given me a extra detail about this that we have to go back and test and look at and so we as a group especially as, as we keep on getting smarter and we keep on absorbing it you know the idea is that when we're on set or when we're in a production it's not just that we know oh this is the way i do it or this is the way people do it but this is why we do it that way and this is what we're why, you know what why you know, and, why do i hold the space bar down and keep right. my book just don't lean on it and, Chris. I'm, and i'm gonna move on i'm gonna move on to the next one because we're running out of time and more questions came in so go ahead next next question what experience does anybody have with using a MiFi modem, little portable modem, as a backup to their local internet for for streaming? It's, you know, it's a modem. <laughs> so uh, I, I have I have one when I'm streaming. I have I have a MiFi in my backpack all the time. And oftentimes I've had a couple different different companies. You know, so I'll have a T-Mobile and a AT and T and a, and a Verizon when I'm doing productions, and so that you know that you can have something that's going out there, and you're constantly looking at them, going, "What is the quality of my signal for the different services?" Because it'll be different on e at every venue. Um, the the main thing is is that you just need to know that that should be not your primary. And usually we call we usually consider our MiFi as the emergency. So if you think about a pace approach where you have primary, alternate, contingency, emergency, usually the E in that the emergency is where we put the MiFi, um, you know, it, as far as how we're going to get out of a, out of a signal, but we carry them because if, you know, push comes to shove, we want to be able to, I need to be able to tell the client that I had a way to get out. I mean, all these things went wrong and I still, we still had a show of, of some sort um, that might be uh, important. Go ahead, Chris, and then Mickey, and then Jan. Uh, forgive the ignorant question, but do, do these modems show uh, signal strength on each one of them? They and do. You can tell. Yep, absolutely. Which service is stronger in that particular area? Yeah, you can see the little bars, but if you dig okay. into them, most of the time they'll tell you some more signal, you know, more signal strength data on the little screen. And definitely in the, if you, 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 different modems will have different things, and I can't remember which one does which, but some of them, if you plug them into the USB, you can actually get more on the web, on their web page. Got you. Um, or on their service page than they, than they have. But you can, you can get a lot of that information just from the little screen on the, on the top. Yeah, right, absolutely. Cool, uh, Mickey? Yeah, for uh, backup cellular modems, um, I seem to get the better luck with the more, uh, the bigger ones, not the little MiFi ones, but these yeah. that have actual um, Ethernet jacks at the back. And yeah. these, these usually come with um, ports where you can plug in uh, external antennas. Yep. Yeah. And then those, and there's some, there's some, you can get some big fins for those that, that, that are, that definitely yeah. will improve the stability and the quality. You can get omnidirectional ones, you can get, get directional ones. Yep. 
yeah, so there's there's definitely some bigger versions of those that that you, that can be used. Jan, last last one. I, and tried, then I, I tried to get one in five G, but I can't find any. Does anybody know? Yeah, when, I haven't. When that's going to become any. available? Well, there's not a lot of five G out there right now, but um, for the places yeah, I've been yeah, on the lookout any, as well them. and haven't seen haven't them seen yet. Them yet. They are, you know, I know that there are some companies building camera backs that are just 5G built in. So you just literally pop it in the back and, and uh, it'll, uh, and off it'll go. So it's, which is going to be cool. Tucker, and then, la and then we'll move on. Yeah, the, um, if you're doing work with a government agency in the U.S., um, you may reach out, especially if it's a, like a, has any connection to emergency. Um, they have access to priority LTE uh, SIM cards. And the priority LTE SIM cards are really nice, uh, especially if you're in a very dense environment because they get priority over literally anything else on the tower. Um, and so those can make a really good backup option um, if you can get access, but you, you just have to speak and have a conversation with them about that. <laughs> it gives me a reason to get contracts with the government. <laughs> you know, like, let's figure that out just to get that. Why, why did you work with the government? I need those SIM cards. So, uh, all right, next question. Mitty versus ProPresenter for external graphics playback. Hi, Damon. It's so nice to nice to have you in the group. Um, now we're going to bring Damon on sometime to talk about his what he does. Um, yes. Yes, I think I think we need to bring Damon on soon. Uh, anyway, so the um, I have not used Mitty with the key fill out yet, but assuming that it works well, and I'm going to be testing that soon. Assuming that that the key fill works uh, with Mitty. Uh, I probably lean towards MIDI because it, it's it is simpler, you know. It's just a simpler playout system for what what I need. Um, I'm assuming that that's what you're you're asking about. Uh, I think the Presenter Pro is a great app. It's just a really heavy app that does a lot of things that does a lot more. And we've used it for key fill playout. Um, but I'm you know I think that for something that you're in a studio and I happen to have a little bit better idea of what Damon is using it for. And and if you in a studio when you're just trying to do playouts with key fill or or just basic playouts, I think MIDI might be a better a better solution than than uh, Presenter Pro. Again, there's a lot more features in Presenter Pro and a lot of great tools. It's just it may be overkill for for just a basic uh, playout system. Any other comments about that? Okay, next next question. Uh, Michael Jones says, with regards to Zoom security, um, what's better, webinar or meetings? Um, I, I don't think that. The security is the same for both of them. I find that there's more control, just generally control of the of the show flow with webinar. I mean, that's what it's designed for. Uh, my my wife, as I said it earlier, she runs meetings all day <laughs> for for um, uh, for a meditation center. So she's she's constantly in meetings, and so we we you know uh, walking around, we have discussions about the we compare and contrast. I find that meetings are kind of chaos. You know, to me, like having everybody who joined, if we had 200, we have 234 people in here right now. And if everybody was in Windows and we didn't, we weren't able to check their mics and their cameras and everything else, it would just be chaos. <laughs> so, so I don't, I, I think that, um, I think, I don't think it's, it is a little bit of a security issue that the sense that we can, right now we have it very closed. You can't really, you can't just jump in and start pushing images or, or saying things to everyone. You can do it in the chat room. But that's it, you know. So we have um, a fair bit of uh, control, you know, over you know how people, you know, especially especially the way we do it because we're promoting this publicly. We're promoting a link publicly. Um, there are advantages to the meetings, which is that you do have everybody in the, in the group. If you're not getting to a, I, I just for a meeting of fifty, I probably do a meetings for two hundred and thirty seven. I think that webinars work is a better structure. So um, anyway, so that's the. Uh, that's my opinion between the two because we do a fair bit of both. Anyone else have any strong opinions about that of webinar? I don't think there's the security features are all built into it in a, in a sense that it works either way. Well, um, um, the, the, in, in meetings, you don't have this uh, attendees area. You can put people in a waiting room, but they can't see the content at all until you're going to let them out. Right. And you don't know who they are when you let them out. So you're right. much that's the webinar and so yeah i mean technically for security as far as logins and so on and so forth but i i find that i find uh meetings is a i mean i, I find that webinars is a more civilized approach <laughs> to the process but, you know i have some complaints you know i i, I want to be able to break this into into groups i want to be able to have i think that the participants should be able to see each other like just see each other's names you know right now we I've, i have opened it up so they can see the list of the number of people watching but 
but I think they should be able to see each other's names so they just get a sense of who's there. Um, and so there's a bunch of things about it that I, I think that we should at least have options for. But, uh, but anyway, but it's, it's, um, it is uh, not there yet. Go ahead, Yashai. Uh, Zoom announced uh, that in the near future, for the paid account only, they're going to offer high-end security end-to-end -end en encryption uh, for meeting, addressing all this issue. And I think it's coming up with the next few months. So I think mm -hmm. that's, I think they want to target like government and people who really need high security. So Zoom is... Yeah. Zoom is going to be the, currently. I think that by the end of the summer, my, my guess is Zoom yeah. is going to be yeah. probably the most secure place to do this kind of meeting. Um, you know, they, they, that's all they're, I mean, they've said this a couple of times publicly that all they're worried about is how do they manage scale and, you know, how do they get back to 720 or 1080p and how do they keep it really secure? I think are the two things that they're spending a lot of money on. Phil, go ahead. Click. Did you ever ask for HD status with Zoom? We're waiting. Okay. Yep. Yep. I have, I have made a fairly good request. <laughs> so, so we're just we're waiting to see how that, you know, what, what that happens in the pipeline. Um, go ahead. If next, they do next that, question. can we get makeup tips? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. we. <laughs> I want to uh, remind next, everybody that the question should be four lines. So Andrew, if you want to re-ask yours, Grant yeah. Whitehead uh, says, do you have, uh, Grant, that name sounds familiar. Do you have Rod. any AWS <laughs> architect contacts? I don't, you know, I think a lot of us are kind of hacking through AWS and doing what we need to do and watching their horribly boring videos about how to, how their feature works. It's just such a, like, you're just like, really? This is the best you could do? You've got a huge company. <laughs> <laughs> just like these horrible videos. Like when I talk about not not having, uh, you know, like not talking. About, there's no person. It's just a PowerPoint slide, or I think it's Captivate or something or whatever, or, or whatever they're using. And it's just this really, really boring slide with a guy who talks in a way that makes me want to go to sleep. So every time you figure it out, and the first half of it is always worthless. And so you always have to just go to the middle and see where see where what you skipped over and move back a little bit, and then watch it if you're trying to figure out some feature. But generally, there's probably. Um, we should probably, given that I'm doing a lot more in AWS, which is why I feel the pain, we probably will create an AWS Discord channel just so we can talk about it because I think a lot of us are trying to figure some stuff out. I'm really trying to move a lot of the stuff because of the link. Like I'm talking to some folks and they're like, uh, can you do this stream for us? I'm yeah, I'm just going to send you a box. P plug the box, plug the SDI into the box, plug the box into a Ethernet, and then I'll, I'll reroute it for you. <laughs> like, like I don't want to, you know, that's that's as easy as, as I think my, it's going to end up for us as we start to buy more of these boxes. Um, my, Peter? My, my friends here in Seattle make those videos and they get paid by the pound. By the pound. Um, <laughs> Grant, <laughs> I have um, some AWS contacts and he's a good friend of mine. I used to work with at National Australia Bank. He now works for AWS. He's based out of Melbourne, Australia. I'll put my email in the uh, chat. Even in the same time zone, what are the chances? Not only do we have an answer for Grant, but it's in the same time zone, in the same country. It's uh, yeah. amazing. <laughs> All right, next, uh, next question. Uh, does anyone have any experience with this webcam? Uh, I'm pointing at it. It's the A. O N I A thirteen. It looks like a lot like a Logitech. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I mean, so so the um, uh, it looks like it looks like they knocked off a Logitech, um, and it's it's a new release and it's less expensive. And um, the only thing you know, we have to test it. I mean, I don't know, um, but the 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 challenge is always related to this is really the uh, the shutter speed, you know, and the sensitivity. So Microsoft makes a lot of ones that on paper look good. But there's something about their shutter speed that's really slow, so everyone looks like they, they're kind of dreamy all the time. So if you stand, sit there in a meeting and you're not moving very much, it looks fine. But as soon as you do anything, it doesn't look fine, you know. And so, um, so that's the that's the challenge there. Okay, one last question, and then we're gonna we're gonna um, bump over. The last question is, and I think this is ref referencing a comment that you made about mm -hmm. five thousand dollar jobs. Uh, Jose Mario Santa Maria says, when you get asked for the cheapest service, the $5,000 package, what does it include? There is no like package. Like I don't have packages. I, I'm pretty much a bespoke service provider. So, so if you come to us, we take a look at what you want to do and we tell you how much it's going to cost to do it. Um, if you say you have 5,000, then we back into that or 10,000, we back into it and say, this is what you can do. But it, it may be, 
a camera somewhere or a couple cameras, or it might be uh, in the $5,000 range for us, it's usually virtual events. So it's like, hey, we can use our system and we can call everybody over Skype and we can put it all in. And if it's not too complicated, we can make that work. So it just depends on that. It's, it's really, I don't really have a package or a, or a menu. All right. We are, we've made it to the second hour. <laughs> so, so, um, so we're here in the second hour and we're going to talk about collaborative music uh, creation. Um, so, so how do you build music uh, with people living in, um, you know, in different places and how do they collaborate back and forth? Oh, and we need to turn off the, the uh, YouTube 